Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. I'm excited for today's show, and I'm glad you're tuning in because this episode is about a doctor who heals chronic physical pain and emotional issues where others cannot. I know him personally, so it really is a pleasure when I get to bring him on the show. This show, Dare to Dream, has been nominated for Two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award, and we've just been mentioned in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. So you're definitely in the right place. And I thank all of them for their beautiful recognition. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do energy work, healing work out in the world, anywhere in the world. You can become a facilitator or take a class. Go to Dr. Dane here, D-A-I-N-H-E-E-R.com, drdanehere.com or accessconsciousness. Com. I'm Debbie Dashinger, and I'm a media visibility expert. I run a visibility hub where I teach my clients how to write a highly engaging page turner book. I have two fresh new spots in my class. If you would like to be coached to write your book, two people just published theirs, so they left those spots open. Go to debbiedashinger.com slash visible visionaries and register. I also have a company that takes your book to a guaranteed international bestseller, fully done for you. And the third leg of my hub is showing you how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results. I've also got a free gift for you, and that's got templates and videos, how to do all of this visibility work to great effect out in the world. Go to debbiedashinger.com slash gift. That's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. So I've got a doctor here today, and my guest is Dr. Gregory Tarrin, who's a social scientist and holistic doctor. He's trained in psychology, behaviorism, sociology, anthropology, ethology, and human behavior. His second degree is in osteokinesiotherapy and applied kinesiology with treatment methods such as osteopractice soft techniques, cranial sacral therapy, kinesiology, and functional neurology. I'm actually going to read all of this because I want you to understand the wonderful soup of what is available to him as a healer and as a doctor. Gregory worked in the field of neurophysiology with elite athletes as the physical and the physician healer for Olympic swimmers, judo, and Sambo wrestlers. Dr. Taran is well-versed in psychotherapy, gestalt therapy, hypnotherapy, psychosomatics, somatic experience, new German medicine, satori healing, and psychokinesiology. He integrates his methods to diagnose and treat patients with chronic diseases, autoimmune illness, medical conditions with unknown etiology, cancer remission, and other before untreatable conditions. His methods have resolved conditions such as lupus, IBS, arthritis, colitis, allergies, kidney disease, lymphoma, migraines, and infertility problems. Dr. Taran has eradicated patients' chronic problems with back pain, neck pain, joint, foot, knee, hip, and jaw pain. He has also eliminated the stress-related conditions of anxiety, depression, fear, low self-esteem, abandonment, resentment, frustration, disappointment, and suppressed sexuality. If you'd like to learn more about him, go to drtaran.com. It's Dr. D-R-T-A-R-A-N dot com. And with that, I welcome Dr. Gregory Taran to Dare to Dream. It's awesome to have you here. And unmute yourself so we can hear you, please. Hello, Debbie. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm very keen to be um, on your show. I'm very keen to meet your listeners, and I'm ready to share with me all my experiences and all of the knowledge that I have and the opportunity to share this to people. Mm, me too, which is really extensive knowledge. I mean, you're young. How, I, that's my first question. You're so young. You're only 35. And this education, how long have you been on the path 
learning, getting certified, becoming a doctor, and all these extracurricular activities that you added to the doctor healer soup you've got going. Um, that's a really very, very long story. It started probably three years old when I um, used um, my knowledge. I don't know where from. I cho chose to be a priest when I was home. And my mother was very interesting because I got out of, um, of my house and I was starting talking to kids. And um, they were saying, you know, that some, the time as God is coming back on the earth. And um, I didn't know why, but I was going to church um, almost every Sunday. But lately in the day, um, in 2000, my father died from a disease. It was a kidney disease. And the etiology of the disease was unknown. Mm -hmm. And um, he was very, very stressed about it. And we as a family were very stressed about it because nobody knew what the theology of this um, disease was. And nobody was able to help, even though my father and my mother, they started to um, search alternative methods, traditional, medical, anything. And um, finally he died and um, his kidneys um, dried out. Mm -hmm. Is a, a very rare type of uh, pyelonephritis and um, nobody knew what, what to do. And after that, I was so shocked um, that I wanted to, I promised myself, I will help people. So I'll become a better doctor. I will, I'll turn, I will leave no stone unturned until I will not understand what happened. And now today I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say, I understand what happened with my, with my father. Oh. Um, I could have been helping him um, to, to be alive, but he paid with his life um, to insert this motivation in me um, to be a better doctor and to find out what was the problem. Wow, that's a powerful story. It's so interesting how um, yeah. people's and after pain that, of course, and their wound after... becomes their gift, right? You know, something happens in somebody's life and it's a tragedy. And for those of us who choose to go to the other side of tragedy and heal through it, we end up having a gift for the world, some kind of message and gift. And it sounds like that's what you did. That's, that's true. And um, actually it was a calling. It was a calling inside of me. Uh, when, I, when I turned about 15, I, I went to high school. And when we started to um, learn about more about anatomy and human physiology and all these classes we've got there, I was the best in that um, um, you know, field. And um, I, you know, worked so hardly for myself because from those days I knew I am a doctor inside mm -hmm. of my heart. But when we started to learn neurology and I started to learn about neurology and there were so many questions that, you know, teachers and professors couldn't answer. And I was got, um, you know, I've got already disappointed by um, the 12th grade, um, and, you know, and um, I was thinking myself how to become that doctor that can heal, can answer questions. Uh, that most doctors can not do it. So um, it was the first path when I went to school. I applied in um, in three different uh, ways because uh, I I grew up in a in a family where poverty was around us, and we don't have money for um, for school. So I applied in three different universities, and the first one was um, social sciences. Okay, so I went to know about and to learn about human behavior first. Mm. And um, so I learned how people behave, why it happens, why in, in, in different perspectives where, you know, making specific decisions is was very, very important. And this was the most important thing that I could have done in my life, because if I was just a regular doctor with my first faculty, probably I would never come back to social sciences that deep mm. as I did the first time. And of course, after that, I started to work. I had my ideas how to change the world. And um, after I graduated, uh, straightforward, I went to a, um, you know, um, internal affairs department, one of our, um, you know, ministries. And um, they took me over there. I wanted to change the world. And um, somebody started to criticize me. Okay. And then I said, um, if they start to criticize me, then I'll go and I'll change my life and i'll change life of individuals if i cannot change the life of thousands through the administrative system and uh, this is what i did i went straight forward to the next school 
um, which was a medical um, holistic school um, based on a physiotherapy and um, um, medical kinesiology. And um, I graduated it already in, in the next four years. So which take the first um, uh, four years, I've got a social science, and then I, I made another four years um, for, uh, for my physical therapy and medical kinesiology degree. And then I did, a, um, in the same time, I did a master's degree in social sciences. And then I started to do my PhD in osteopathic um, um, medicine. Um, it's still ongoing, so I'm still learning as everybody else. And uh, I'm still getting more and more um, you know, experienced every day. But I was already, um, you know, but that, but that day when I started to treat patients, I already had a lot of knowledge from the first school, which is and great. You're originally from Romania, is that right? Um, I'm originally from Republic of Moldova, but it's pretty much um, the neighbor of Romania. We were the same country back in the days. Uh, two separate countries, but the same nation. Moldova. And now you're in Los Angeles. Yeah, I'm based in Los Angeles for many years now, and um, I'm having my private practice here, and it's going awesome. And I want to know this, actually, for personal reasons. You, uh, obviously, because I see you personally for my doctor, I know you treat people in person, but if somebody is not located readily in Los Angeles, do you do remote sessions? Can you help them that way? Um, as much as uh, somatic experience works for us and psychotherapy and all the pain that I can physically feel through the cam, which means if I will induce you, I will say, Debbie, look here mm -hmm. or anybody else, look at my arm and see your fear, any fear or any pain. And I'm giving this to you right now in the cam. Mm -hmm. How's it now when my arm is here? How do you feel? Terrible. Yeah. So this is how I induce people into their pains, into their fears. And then we're working on that fears or, or that pain. And we're starting to see where this pain originates. And after that, we're starting the psychotherapy and different methods again, and we're cleaning that. So most of the people, I had people that um, we had sessions throughout um, the world, for example, in Switzerland, somebody couldn't lift the arm and they had this symptom called frozen shoulder mm. um, all over the medical schools, right? But um, I did one session and they were able to do it like this. They had no more shots, nothing. Um, so it all was psychosomatics. Or somatic um, experience yeah awesome okay and i want to like deep dive a little bit so things like trauma things like resilience things like healing how do you define them what is a big trauma what is a small trauma um it's a very hard um multi um erhi process so we're trying um we're starting with a complex diagnostic uh, process so we're doing our diagnosis based on different methods and uh, there are included massive methods as channel meridian system as a reflexology osteopathic perception uh, muscle testing and other methods in order to understand where are the people to assess where they are right now in their health and how the body in, you know, reacts to that. So basically when the body is in front of me, I have more tools and resources to know better what's going on with the person rather than on, uh, on internet. But on internet, we have a lot of good cases as well, um, which just you know, brings me a little bit less tools to work that efficiently. Um, but comparison, you know, in comparison to many other people works the same way, um, you know, it works very well. But now let me tell you about hierarchy. And um, it's the first thing what we do is we understand on which level the body reacts. Okay, so we have three levels. Okay, we have mind, we have unconscious and we have subconscious. So most people or mo most of the literature you'll find um, on the web um, and out there in the universities will talk about unconscious and subconscious as the same thing. Not the same with me, okay? So in my case, I found specific patterns for unconscious and subconscious. Unconscious meaning that this is your body and the body reacts to everything that your DNA learned throughout a 400 million years of evolution. So when you say something like that, would you 
mean, just so the listeners can understand, we're talking about lineage, we're talking about ancestry, is that correct? Are yeah. we also talking about our past lives that- No, contribute? not here, not here, not at this point. Um, the past lives is energy uh, thing, and it's, um, it's a little bit different, and I'll explain it after. But we start with the body because most of the people are, um, you know, they know the body. You know, if, if, I, if I'm hungry, so I know I'm hungry, I need to eat. This is a signal, okay? If I'm thirsty, I know I need to drink. This is an instinct, okay? If I'm cold, I need to wear something. So this is what I'm talking about right now. All of these instincts and signs from your body, they are unconscious. You're not thinking about this. The body signals you, okay? The signals in order to go and do the things correctly in order to survive, okay? So body always does something to survive and for evolutionary purposes. The soul, which is something thinner where the programs of our body are subconscious guided. And there are like two splits. One is subconscious, which learns your life from your conception moment until death. And the other part of your subconscious is a spiritual part of your subconscious, which involves other things as theta healing, as soul, as past lives, regressions, and all this stuff. I'm very curious how... I, I want to ask this in a way that makes sense, but how you know what you know. So when, when you do something like this, let's say we'll take that one example of something you do. So something's going on with somebody, you get very clear, you bring something to them and say, I'll try to do it in the camera too. And then you say, you know, how do you feel? Or what's the first thing that comes up for you? Let's use that. Um, the first when somebody that says, because sometimes it's completely unrelated. Right. It must it seems like the most bizarre thing someone could say in that moment. But that's what popped up. And we say it to you and then you're off and running and somehow it intersects and ends up creating a healing. How do you do that? It's um, it, it depends how we do it. If we do it online, it's one way. If we do it in front in, in person is different way. So when I have somebody in front of me, I don't really need them to talk too much. OK, because I'm doing a comprehensive diagnosis. So I'm starting to um, see how the body functions and adapts itself on movement and how the reflexes work so I can read the body. So for example, if they come in here and they say, oh, I have the problem in my neck, I may find the problem in their foot, okay? So if you find a problem in the foot and this problem is related because I can see the reflexes in the body is related to your mental issues or to your psycho-emotional issues, so I can tell you that straightforward. And there is no doubts about it because the body never lies, mm -hmm. never. If you know to read it correctly, you will know exactly how to assess it. If the person is not in front of me, okay, I try to induce to speak, to see what they talk about their life. And when they say specific things that I know they are related to specific organs, functions in the body, then I ask them, I induce them that feeling, that problem, that pain. And they ask them, where is that located? The same as in somatic experience. And they're telling me it's my, in my foot. I feel it in my foot. I feel energy in my head. I feel pain here. I feel pain in my chest or in my throat. So I can feel it here. Don't, don't give me that. No, I don't want it. I fear. I feel it in my trapezoid muscle, right? Trapezius muscle. So this is how we are getting to the point. Not always people are starting to feel that very fast or like straightforward, but easily, easily, you know, we're modeling, modeling and modeling and, you know, easily getting into that stage where people can feel themselves and they can feel the symptoms on their body. And then I know where to dive in. Or sometimes, it's not only about the body. Some people will tell you never, I don't feel anything. Okay, don't give me this hand because I don't feel anything. So you have to, you have to work differently with these people and you have to have methods to work with these people too because they're patients too. This is just only difference between different kinds of, 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 of um, brain thinking. They're mosaic brain th thinkers. They're like more female, more male um, uh, patterns. There's, 
just different people. And when you have a male pattern or a mosaic pattern, you have to give different messages. And we're starting to use logic, intellect, our mind to see what their patterns or thinking are. And I'm just, you know, trying to go through their strategies of thinking and see where the shortcuts are. So for example, if for someone um, in the childhood today, they will say, oh, I'm in poverty. I can't afford myself a car, a treatment, a holiday. And I say, okay, how do you feel when we don't have money? And they say, mm, you know, I feel very, very shrunk and I feel not good at, um, at all. I feel this anxiety. And I say, okay, if you feel that worries in the body, they say, don't tell me that because I don't know, but I know how I think about it. And I said, okay, if you think about it, then tell me what that means for you. And they will tell you, what is that meaning for me? It means that I don't have money. I can't afford anything. And I said, okay, what that means for you then? And then he will say, hmm, interesting question. What can mean for me that I cannot afford something for myself? And we're going straightforward logic, mind by money, and they are going to the point that they are fear about their parents, that they, their parents didn't have money home. We're going straight to childhood when they will say, oh, I was, um, I broke something when I was little and I knew my father and my mom, they didn't have money and I was shameful. I feel that shame and I was fearful what they will feel when they will know that I bro broke it down. So that feeling is living in that person today and makes their body feeling ill and giving the symptoms on the foot. And the foot gives the symptoms to their neck. Isn't it interesting? Yeah, incredibly so. Uh, so you must have some very interesting cases, especially when you take on chronic emotional issues, chronic, chronic physical issues. And I really appreciate you giving that example. Will you give a client example of something chronic that had a really good ending to it? And you don't have to obviously give away any names, but I would really appreciate hearing some more. Of course. Um... Uh, one of the most important um, case I've had in my life was a woman. Uh, she had IBS since she was five years old, five years old. She had it over 50 years because she came in around a 60 years old um, stage in my office. And when I met her for the last 14 years, she wasn't able to get outside really. Um, she wasn't going anywhere because she was going to bathroom about 15 to 20 times a day and about 10 to 15 times every night. And um, it was very hard to get somewhere else. And it was very hard to go, um, you know, um, make some groceries, um, you know, shopping. And um, we did it and she started um, with, with some kind of traditional medicine. Then she went through official medical, um, you know, centers and all the stuff um, until she got to me, she like had like, at least 25 years of active healing and she couldn't heal herself. And I don't say that in order to just to say how you know, great I am. I just say how much we brought into life of this woman. And um, we started with the assessment, of course, and all the problems she told me she had uh, psychologically was not there where I, where I found them actually. So she was directly not in the same idea because she started to do psychotherapy before, hypnotherapy before, healing sessions before, Humira and all this time kind of medications. We're not talking about pills at all and steroids, of course. So nothing really helped her. I don't say that pills at some point doesn't help, you know, but not in her case. And uh, she was disappointed, of course. And when she came into my office because I could have read the body and I could get into subconscious and trigger exactly the points where all the switches for bad thinking was creating this pattern of not accepting the things in her life, which brought her IBS. And uh, we treated her very, um, I would just say for the, um, 
period of time with treating her was a fast one because she was actually the hardest patient I've had uh, with the longest disease I've had. Um, so this is one case. And um, I can't tell you exactly one, two situations in her life because they were like probably over 50 very important, very big trauma. So she was a very traumatic woman um, from a uh, woman from, from childhood. And um, she had a lot of conflicts with her parents, with her mom, uh, ancestry line, um, brothers, sisters, and then husbands and everything she could have had, she had. Um, and suddenly she got good. She was like on the, um, on the process going on and on and on and on, nothing happened until one day, and she said, calling me and said, crying, I said, I started to not have this, you know, calling to bathroom. And um, she was crying. She was literally crying about for 20 minutes on the phone. And I was so happy. And this is, these are the moments where, um, you know, I get so much energy and um, I feel that I'm blessed. And I, I thank God and I thank the universe for these opportunities that they gave it to me. And thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm grateful. Ah, oh. wow, cool. So she can another, go to her house and live a life. Yeah, another great case is when I had a patient, he had um, chronic, um, it was a chronic colitis arthritis and it's er and erosive arthritis. And um, he had stools with bod for about three years, uh, two and a half, three years, because he came to me when he was about two and a half years in his disease. And um, until he hit it three years after the disease started, he was done. And um, nobody could have ever stopped this. He got steroids again. He got Humira. He, uh, he stayed on Humira for a lot of time. But what is important here is not only the, the, the blood in the stool, but he, you know, when um, they're trying to make transfusions, they're trying to give him some blood from outside, they um, try to do some kind of things to retain the blood. Uh, the body noticed that. And the important thing here is the body started to reject iron. Mm. So his ferritin levels started to drop down. Mm. So once the human started to interfere with this process, so the body, the subconscious felt it and said, okay, my purpose is to leave this person without blood, so dying. Okay, pretty much. We can just say that, assume. Mm -hmm. So if you give me blood or you're trying to stop it, I won't take iron. What for body means iron? For body, iron means oxygen. The oxygen means breathing. Breathing means life, okay? So when we started giving him iron, what, import, what interesting, the body started to not transform iron into ferritin. Okay, so which means the body has a clear decision to kill the body. So there is nothing you can do if the body has a real mindset and a program to kill you in a way. It will do everything. Subconscious is so powerful. Which is very much like what an autoimmune disease is. The body attacks itself. Exactly. So we've um, treated a lot of autoimmune and they, they're treated the best way and the easiest way. So like allergies, like asthmas, like um, any kind of, um, uh, we have this kind of um, uh, thyroid issues that you know, are around the planet now everywhere because people are in hurry and this triggers you as you are not succeeding to do the things. So it triggers your um, you know, thyroid hormonal balance and um, it tells us that we need to work towards those things because uh, people are getting stressed and traumated by some things in their life and they're not aware of it. Okay. And so I want to finish with that. So you've got this guy with this colitis, his body is releasing blood and rejecting iron. His uh, numbers are going down. And then what happens? Um, actually, um, what important here it was then we were started to chase this subconscious mind and to have the answers from subconscious. I have my own method to talk to subconscious, which is very important. So um, then I understood what subconscious wants from him. Subconscious wants from this guy to change his mindset at all. He was thinking um, not a proper way for his living. 
So his subconscious wanted him to change his mindset. He changed the personality. Okay, so for example, he's going home and he's talking to his wife and he reacts in a manner to what he, uh, his wife says. So the subconscious wanted him, for example, he you know, reacted with irritability, with anger. Interesting. Or frustration. Mm. The body didn't want that. The body wanted from him to be calm, to accept all these things and to go through other periods. For example, if he goes to his you know, um, job and, 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 and he's just a simple guy, um, a nice businessman, but a still a simple guy, and he goes with his customers. And sometimes not all the customers are the most gentle people. And you know, they can make some mistakes, they can have bad days too. And he reacts in a way because he's, he sees himself as a helper, okay? And when, when somebody reacts to his help, not in the way he um, is expecting, he was disappointed, he was frustrated, he was even depressed, he was angry, he was annoyed, he was anxious. And the body wanted him, subconscious wanted him to react differently and to accept his people. And once we started to work on his behavior and change all of his behavior patterns at home with his wife, with his kids, because he's different kids, you know, the biggest one and the smallest one in different relationships, even with his dogs. Because he got autoimmune on the dogs, two allergies. So we took off the allergy from the dogs. The body shifted that allergy to the lash of the dog. <laughs> and then we, we took that off. Isn't it interesting? Mm -hmm. And when we took everything off and I showed him many, many, many times, this is the problem, this is the problem, this is the problem, this is the problem. Now he has a lot of settings, okay? He understand like, you know, have these programs. He understand how he have to behave and to react to most of the situations and people in his life. Like family, work, you know, hobby, free time, um, you know, social life. And once he understood all these things, he finally had no blood in his stool. Wow. That, so it sounds so much like we're all computers and these experiences program us, even though it's not for the best living or health, it programs us even aberrantly. And what you do essentially as a doctor is you go in there and you reboot, right? Yeah. You, take out the virus, you refresh the computer that we are so that we can be clean and healthy and move forward. So I'm curious when you tell these stories. So let's say, Dr. Taryn, that you get somebody who comes to you and says, oh, you know, I have this problem. It's persisting. Nobody can fix it. And you're working with this person and you come up with some age, something that you seem to be able to do. But you say, you know, something happened to you at age 13. And what happens if the person sitting in front of you goes, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I got nothing. Where do you go from there? Yeah, um, this is the usual case that happens in my office because I'm assessing very fast. So the people can go that fast with me because we're not doing hypnosis at this level. So when a person comes to me, I have to do a whole approach, right? Holistic approach to full the body. So um we are trying to get as much as possible from every angle so the body cannot fool us because many times the body can fool you start trying to fool you but the body never likes if you know how to read it again and um so when you give a certain idea to a person and say you have a trauma 13 years and they say they don't feel it they don't know it they don't see it we're trying to go again i told you before in mosaic brain thinking we're going through the logic and we're going this pattern and going what is this what if that because i know exactly the trauma so the first thing let me tell you one thing because you won't understand like that the first thing i i do is i assess what happened okay pretty much how do i assess it i understand what kind of emotion is there i can read it this is my proficiency this is my expertise. So I read exactly what emotion is there. 
Okay, so if I know if, if there is anger, for example, if there is anxiety, if there is disappointment, if there is judgment, if there is shame, if there is, I don't guilt, whatever, fear, okay, most common, an abandonment feeling, rejection feeling, it can be a lot of them, okay, so if I know exactly the main feelings there, so I can start with the cases, or just a philosophy, you know, philosophy, talk about this feeling in his life and I can still go down the road and get to that point it's longer just okay. longer. how long generally when people come to see you how long generally um, does it take for you to get from where they come plop in your office chronic issue to okay. they leave and they're free yeah um I understand your question now we have to of course to divide a few categories of people for example, for most kids, we have one to three sessions, okay? So most kids, like 75 kids, I need just one or two sessions, 75% of them. Uh -huh. uh, and of course, it all depends what cases of what these kids are, because they're like chronic disease, and, you know, a problem, like physiology problems with these kids, you know, um, uh, uh, they are um, born with this issue. So we need more time with this, you know, um, hard cases, let's say, and or red cases. Um, same thing happens with the um, adults. So adults, like after 18 to 35, they really need about three to four sessions to feel healed, like in medium, right? It just, just is an average. And um, if we're going over 35, 45, they're like, they need another one or two sessions, like maybe four, five, six. And if we're going with chronic diseases, okay? we are going maybe 10, maybe eight, or if it's very, very, very hard disease, like untreatable disease or something that we really want to bring back into your life, you need probably more than 15, but it all depends, okay? So somebody is faster, somebody is slower. You cannot say that everybody is the same. So with that guy, I told you, we changed everything in his life. We made a rewiring in there, in his brain. How, how is he there? How is he a job? How is he a job when something goes wrong? How is he at home when his wife is not the way he wants? His dogs are not behaving the way. His you know, son is not behaving the way. His daughter is not this. And you know, all the aspects of life, we're going all over. So this kind of cases, they need more time. But most of the people, they don't need that. They just need to show them the problem. Like one, two, three, four. They've got three, four sessions mm -hmm. and it's done. So an average person <laughs> gets an average, maybe three to five sessions. Very interesting. Okay. I'm, not I'm trying not to feel bad about myself <laughs> right now. We won't go into that. <laughs> um, how about you? Have you ever needed to be healed of anything that was chronically ongoing? Have you had yourself an experience where something was so persistent and frustrating and now- Yes, of yeah? course, definitely. I had it in, um, um, what was it, 2011, I guess? 2011 or 12, doesn't matter. I was in the medical school already and um, um, my grandma died. And I was learning and I'm, you know, studying and I was training myself. I was working with um, athletes at that time, Olympic athletes as well. Uh, and um, I started sadly to feel bad in about a week or two after she died, I started to feel bad. I understand that um, I understood by that time that this is a psychosomatic reaction of my body. Uh, but anyway, um, I didn't have all the knowledge I do have today. Okay, so I was still in the medical school and um, the psychology point there was not that elevated. The consciousness and belief in what I did uh, back in th those days was not as strong as today. So I found myself as everybody else to go to, you know, to doctor and say, okay, let's see what is going on to my therapist. So I went a circle of 14, 14 you know, specializations, 14 doctors, neurology, traumatologists, virologists, 
um, other laryngologists, gastrologists, and all these kind of doctors you can even imagine. And I did it twice. They couldn't find the etiology of my fever and of my, uh, of my pain and, and everything I had in my body. Then this, of course, put me, um, I put myself a question. What is, what is wrong with me? And it took me about three months to do this because it's not in one day. Every doctor will send you to make some diagnosis, some blood tests, some you know, images, something, right? So they need something to prove, to show you exactly. This is allopathic medical school, which they, um, you know, they have to prove it. They have to show you, let's say it's a showcase, okay? So they weren't able to see anything wrong in my body. Not hormonally, not biochemically, not structurally, nothing, not neurologically. I had three MRIs done during this three months period of time. I lost so many hours in the, in the clinics. It's, it's, it's impressive. I still remember these days and I was so frustrated that nobody could have been helping me. And then finally I asked, why wouldn't you um, just recommend me to go um, for research purposes? Like, because you don't know, let me go in an institute, a medical institute and let's research something on me because I am doing the school. So I, I know what you're talking about. It's interesting for myself. So finally, because of the legislation, they didn't know where to send me to, okay? Because they need to write down which section, okay? Where department are you going to? It was very, very interesting. Now, after we finally decided uh, where to go, okay, which center, where, how to do it, um, it took about two months, okay, another two months. So I was already in pain for about six months. And during this time, I started to believe in myself more, okay, and to do all the stuff, to start all the stuff that I'm doing right now on people. And in two months and four days, I healed myself. So January 4th, I, you know, it was 20 already, 2012, I woke up with no fever, with no pain. And then I understood what happened. So it pretty much the same pattern as, as, as I told you before, but I, I was so, it was so hard for myself to deliver this consciousness, to dig into it and to see what is wrong with me and where these emotions are coming from and why my body, my unconscious wanted to react to like this. But the problem was like this, I will tell you, was two problems. The first problem, I had a big stress and I was depressed because of the, you know, my uh, passing away of my grandma. But the second problem was that I was very successful at that time. And I was um, in the medical school. I was uh, working with um, Olympic athletes to help them and coaching them through kinesiology, where to go, how to do it and psychology things and how to make their um, diets and all the stuff. So already in, in, in the field, I was working in the field already. I was pretty much 2012, I graduated second school. So I was already very, very, very close to graduate. Okay, so I started working prior to that with some athletes. And um, what important is I was very successful with them and I didn't want to stop. I don't wanna stop and say, oh, hey, my, my grandmother died. So let's stop a little bit. Let's rest a little bit. Let's work on it. I was closing on myself, on my body. And um, I thought as many people think that with your life energy and with your strength, with your neurons strong, you go with your attitude and it's gonna be fine. No. The body keeps accumulating this emotional stress. If the body accumulates emotional stress over 85%, and you'll ask me, how do you know? I have a method to know, this is my method, okay? So I have a method to know exactly how much emotional stress people accumulate over time. So when I know that it's over 85%, it's about to explode. Okay, so you can't keep be that strong and that fast anymore. You need to slow down and to take care of your emotional situation of your emotional tension and release it, which I didn't, as do a lot of people, as a lot of people do actually. And um, this was the main problem and the more, more um, the, you know, the main reason. There were more situations of course, there are a lot of situations I had to work on in my childhood, 
about my grandma, about death of my father. I linked them, of course, I remembered everything. And um, of course it wasn't a very good idea, but when we are in stress situations, uh, we're in stress situations, we don't think logically, okay? In stress situations, we usually think with our fears. We don't really know how to think and we are, we're not educated how to think in stress situations. This is, um, this is what I teach people to do. And this is what I start with, but this leads me to the body anyway, right? Because after we treat the patients with their um, emotional corrections, after that, we treat their hips, their necks, okay? Their backs and everything else, their foot and um, their eyes, their you know, um, hearing, um, their jaws, their pains all over the body, okay? So it, we're turning onto um, osteokinesia or practice already, which we are using their osteopathic methods, we're using kinesiology methods, manual therapy methods, and many other methods, reflexology to use um, uh, on the body in order to give the body the pro proper recovery, rejuvenation, and setting. Uh, for a healthy and abundant life. Can you actually help people? For instance, I wear glasses. Can you help me see better? Or if somebody comes to you and they have, I, I, it's interesting, I don't have any hearing issues at all, but I, I know people who do. Maybe they've lost hearing in one ear or it's not so great, or they were in the music business, et cetera. Can you actually help, help people to recover, recuperate their eyesight? So they don't need glasses and or they're hearing? Yes, of course, we can do that. But it all depends at what level. Because there is like the points where you cannot go um, back already. But for example, if you, you see that, like I, I don't know what to show you, but just like trying to try to see here this button. Okay? okay. And tell me from one to 10, how good can you see it? I see it. Um, yeah, mm, six. Six, okay? So if I'm coming closer, you should see it better, right? Much better, yes. Okay, so if I'm coming here back, you're saying it's six again. If I'm going back again, it's, it's you know, it's even less than six, yeah. right? So One. it's five or four. Now I will keep it here, okay? It's about the, um, the level of my ear. And I'll ask you right now, um, I'll tell you right now, look at my hand here, mm -hmm. okay? And you are in my hand here. You are you at your age and I'm giving you yourself right now, okay? Mm -hmm. Close your eyes, open your eyes. Now you are in my hand and you are 40 years old, 40 years old. You don't think about that, you just take it, okay? Okay, you are in my hand and you are now 20 years old, okay? You're in my hand now and you are 15 years old. Mm -hmm. You're 15 years old. Look at the bottom here. Mm. Do you see the bottom now? You know what's interesting? I can see the thread that there's dark, it's a white button and there's dark thread and I couldn't see that before. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. So in this sense, I can help you. With these things that I induce you already, I can help you, okay? So you can see the thread in it now, okay? So this is the idea. We can help to a specific point, okay? With psychosomatics, okay? With our emotional treatment. Then we can work on your eye nerves and innervation of your eyes. So then um, I use um, my hands, okay? To restore as much as possible your cranial, you know, sacral therapy, okay, cranial therapy on your eyes and on your lobes here and sutures around it to decompress the eye nerves. This is physical already. And there we can help too if there is an issue. So if you would have an issue here structurally as well, so we can help that issue too. So you can see even better. So after that, after that, it's done with the vision, okay? After that, there is already, you know, specialized doctors who can help you with. But in my practice, I had people who had like 70% of their issues on their mind. Man, that's what we're gonna do when we're done with my left hip. That's all I'm saying, we're gonna deal with my eyesight because that, 
I'm down for that. That's beautiful. What was it about here, here you are at 40, here you are at 20, 15 and so forth. What was it about those ages that made some of that correction in the eyesight? Um, the idea is that every person at specific time, and actually it's every day, we're building the book of our life. We're, we're building our genealogy. We're building our history, who we are, okay? So once we age, we're building different programs. Subconsciously, we know exactly now how many neurons we have, not exactly, but we know we have over 100 billion uh, neurons in our brain, but the neurons don't think themselves, okay? We know exactly today for the last two years, we have some research that are showing that chromosomes are the ones who are taking the vibration and starting to make matrices, phys physical matrices in our brain that are read after that, which we call thoughts. So they're downloaded somehow, right? So we're not talking about this thing, but think about it. If you have a thought, which, emo which is emo emotional based, you will put down that thought in your brain because this is how subconscious works. On, water, on one side, you have to have an emotion. On the other side, you have to have words. And when they come together, they create this matrix and they're your chromosomes. The chromosomes start to shape and create, create a specific matrix, which brain can after that read. These matrix will send through a very complex chemical process, the signals to make mRNA. Okay, so then you make these proteins that um, are building specific peptides that are going and changing your DNA. So basically, when I tell you that you're 20 years old here in my hand and you induce yourself in that, the body reprograms itself to that health, to those programs back then. And you see better. Because during the day, you have a lot of programs. During the years, you have a lot of programs where you said to yourself, I don't see this. I don't want to see this. I don't want to see my mom dying. I don't want to see this poverty. I don't want to see this inequity. I don't want to see this, you know. Or I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear this anymore. So somebody can that. be, wow. Okay. All these programs are creating your DNA and stop psychologically, emotionally, you from seeing or hearing the best quality. Got it, man. Okay, so Dr. Gregory or Grigor, your real name, Taran or Taran, yes. as it's really said. Yes. What do you do every day? What is your daily practice that keeps you grounded and keep, keep, keeps you healthy? Do you have a ritual? Um, of course. Um, in the morning, I'm trying to get up about at 5.30 in the morning. Um, I, I'm having two kids. So sometimes it's hard to get up into 5.30. Um, and they're really small. Um, so one is about three years toddler and the second one is about a year, not yet. And um, I'm trying now to say that um, uh, I'm trying every time, every day to get up at 5.30 and um, make some uh, spiritual work for myself, a meditation. And after that, I'm um, starting to um, write down my, um, my things I'm grateful for in this life, uh, about 10 to 20 things. Um, then I can write down my wishes as well. Whatever wishes um, do I have for the, or targets I have for this year um, in the future. And there is a specific algorithm there, but I, th I think it's, um, it's not as so important as the algorithm today. Uh, it's just important what we do there. And um, after that, I'm trying to do some energy work on myself. And um, here I do Qigong. And what I do Qigong, um, it's I'm trying to focus on a real Qigong, not only on exercising or making, um, you know, kind of choreography or Tai Chi, but just trying to feel the energy itself and um, then do uh, the movements because I've, I've been blessed to um, know all, one of my teachers who um, practices half a year uh, in Tibet and um, he's really great of it. And I never knew anybody else who really went to Shaolin themselves and being in person in front of me. So um, this, is a, this was a great opportunity. This is the opportunity that I share with my people and with my clients and with my patients. And I show them what a real Qigong is 
And it's not really only about the idea to practice a lot. It's about how you practice it. And if you practice it correctly uh, for about 15, 20 minutes, you can get enough energy to go throughout the day. And um, then I'm going, um, I'm not having usually a breakfast in the morning. Um, many things people are saying it's, it's useful. I don't do that and I have my reasons. I won't stop here, why? Um, and then um, sometimes of course I'm using, um, 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 you know, intermittent fasting, autophagia. And of course that helps me a lot to maintain uh, my body healthy. And then I'm going to work. I'm driving to work um, to my office, um, which is based in West Hollywood, um, listening to some, um, you know, meditations, listening to some audiobooks. You mean listening to Dare to Dream podcast? Of course. Um, I'm, since I've got to know the, um, you know, your podcast, I'm, I'm, I'm a person who's always awaiting uh, the new things coming in again and again. Every week, every month is getting better. And I congratulate with this. And I hope the audience is going to um, build even more every, every, every month. And um, then I'm, I'm, I'm seeing patients. And then I'm, I'm driving back home. Sometimes I'm going to exercise in a gym, sometimes not. I'm just getting out with my kids. Then having some, um, some um, you know, reading and then going, going to sleep. Beautiful. What do you next dare to dream? This is dare to dream. You already have this amazing soup, if you will, of so many skills and methods that you've been highly trained in that you utilize and that come through you as the filter, as the channel to help people. So what's next for you on this journey of healing others, healing yourself and growing as fast as you're growing? Um, the next point for me is to spread um, my practice to other people. And um, this is an ongoing practice. I will start to um, build the program, the curricula, for uh, passing this knowledge to other people because I brought in and integrated a lot of uh, methods um, I didn't see in other people. And I don't say that all the methods are mine. No, I just integrate a lot of them. And after I integrated those methods, I saw new things, which I brought to the scale. And um, you can find them anywhere in the idea. Okay, you can construct them, but it's, it takes so long to get there. So it's a good idea to show people how to use all these methods, integrate them, and to teach people to um, treat um, chronic diseases, simple conditions as well, any kind of diseases they do have. And um, my next target is to start building this curricula, start writing down a book, and um, starting creating this school or this, um, this new way. Um, movement of, of holistic healing and of healing of the people um, of different diseases from, from, from A to Z to Y. Yeah. If you'd like to learn more about Grigor or work with him or find out more about the incredible things he's doing out in the world, go to drtaran.com. That's D-R-T-A-R-A-N.com. And I end today's show with this quote from Jeanne Achterberg. Healing is embracing what is most feared. Healing is opening what has been closed, softening what has been hardened into obstruction. Healing is learning to trust life. Thanks for tuning in today. Do subscribe to this number one transformation conversation. Next week on the show, I'm having Charmaine Hammond and the screenwriter of the film Back Home Again and their incredible all-star cast. So you'll want to tune into that. It's great conversation. And remember, folks, don't just dare to dream, especially about your health physically and your emotional health. Dare to have it all and to create all your dreams into your reality. And I do wish you the best of health.